Hello and welcome to our second lecture of week nine. So today we are going to be talking about the third century crisis and the Tetrarchy. And this is really a period of unrest for Rome. So things are no longer uh, in the golden age. We're no longer in the, the good five emperors. Um, we are in a crisis as it's labeled. So um, there's a few reasons for this that I want to address before we get into looking at the artwork and the different emperors at this time. Um, the most immediate cause of this period will be the assassination of Alexander Severus, who is the last emperor in the Severan dynasty. But beyond that, there's sort of these deeper issues that Rome has been dealing with um, that have really plagued them for a while, but they're kind of bubbling to the surface now. Um, and the first of those is that the empire is very large. We have a huge expanse of territory. Um, I think it came to its height in 117, I believe, under um, Trajan, at the very end of Trajan's rule. And so um, we're really seeing a very large empire that has become increasingly and increasingly more difficult to manage and to rule. It's hard for one person to rule such a large territory, especially in a time when we don't have, you know, electricity, right? We can't send emails. Um, this is all being done on foot and through, uh, you know, post kind of communication. So um, the empire is getting very hard to deal with just because of its size and, and the resources needed to, to rule such a large area. So that's the first issue. Um, the second issue is that the, the role of the emperor, and we talked a little bit about this last time, it's always been someone who has been, well, or in most cases, a little bit maybe arrogant, a little bit lavish, you know, likes to live a lavish lifestyle, um, all of that kind of elevates themselves above the populace. They're going to become deified after their deaths. Um, but we really start to see that becoming a problem. And this, this kind of cult of the emperor um, is going to lead to such a, a rapid demand for the position of emperor and, um, overall going to lead to sort of a shift in the way that the emperor is, is viewed um, because it just, he just keeps getting this more and more heightened status. Um, and we saw that with the Severans when they started to kind of separate themselves and their own portraiture, right? They didn't want to be depicted with other people with them. We also see it in the way that they're decked out in this, these royal, um, you know, this royal garb, tiaras, lavish clothing. Um, it starts to just increase, increase even more. Um, so those are kind of two of, of the biggest issues. Um, another sort of maybe minor issue, but still kind of one that's persisting um, is that we are starting to see some religious fragmentation. So uh, we talked about these different cults that are going to arise at this time, like the cult of Mithras, the cult of Hercules. Um, obviously a huge one though is also Christianity. That will kind of come to define uh, this part of the world in a few centuries. So um, the, that's also kind of contributing to the largeness of the empire and that it's not as unified as it once was, but we're really starting to see um, religious fragmentation that's starting to kind of, again, poke holes in the, the larger stability and the ability for one person to rule. So a few issues that are kind of uh, plaguing Rome at the moment. Um, but as I said, the uh, most immediate is the assassination of Alexander Severus to end the Severan dynasty. Uh, so if we look at the timeline here, um, this is where we're at. We've covered a lot of different uh, emperors, different uh, dynasties at this point. Um, so we are uh, finishing with the Severans uh, last time and we're getting into the third century crisis, also known as the period of the soldier emperors. Um, and then after that, we'll be getting into the Tetrarchs today as well. But those are sort of two different um, uh, sections or, you know, of rulers uh, in the third century. So as I said, the assassination of Alexander Severus in 235 is going to kick off this third century crisis. Um, we are going to see many people succeed him and we're not even gonna go through all of them because uh, some of them reign for very short periods of time. Um, but the general trend here, as that last slide said, is the idea of a soldier emperor, that this, these are men who have gained power through their military might um, their legions that they have who are very loyal to them. There's a, there's a really system of, um, of loyalty um, between legions and their generals. And so the legions are often going to declare their general as emperor. Um, and so we see a lot of these in rapid succession, um, people being assassinated, people um, being killed one way or the other. As you'll remember, uh, Septimius Severus was the only emperor in the third century to die peacefully. So all of these people are going to meet untimely deaths and usually quite violent deaths also. 
So um, we are going to pick up with Philip the Arab. So Philip the Arab uh, took power in 244. So uh, the, the time that this portrait dates to is also that's the time period of his reign, 244 to 249. Um, he's our first emperor of Arab descent. So we saw that Septimius Severus was the first from Africa. Prior to that, we had the first ones from the provinces in Hadrian and Trajan, uh, both from Spain. And so this is our first Arab emperor. Uh, you can see that he looks very stern, very serious. Um, he has a short, almost kind of military style haircut. Um, it's very short and, and close cropped. Um, it's not super curly like, the, like Septimius Severus's was. Um, it's kind of kept close. Um, he is not super bearded. Uh, there might be a little bit of like a five o'clock shadow, but he doesn't have that full beard that we saw under earlier emperors. Um, but really his facial expression is what strikes you, I think, and, and just how serious, how stern he looks. Um, we see again the drilled pupils, so this use of the drill, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but we also see something that we saw with Caracalla, right? We see a lot of similarities here in this sort of aggressive, um, militaristic nature that they're showing through their portraiture. And one of the big things that I think I mentioned last time is that X that's being created on their face. Um, so we talked about it with Caracalla, um, how his nasolabial lines sort of link up with this, this V or this triangle in his forehead um, to sort of create a, an, a mean or intense look. It looks kind of like he's angry with those lines, but then they link up with this X um, or the other lines in his, in his uh, lower face to create an X on his face, um, which also just kind of gives the impression of, of um, I don't know, just a, a meanness. Like he looks a little scary with that X on his face. And we see that also with Philip the Arab. So we're going to see really deep nasolabial lines, and then we're going to see them mirrored in his forehead here to create kind of a stern expression. He looks like he's he's furrowing his brow. He, like Caracalla, is also looking off to the side. So he's not looking right at you. He's not looking up toward the heavens, but he's looking off to the side as if he's kind of assessing the situation, you know, making sure that no one uh, sneaks up on him. Um, and overall, just, I mean, this man looks like he is a military commander. Um, that's definitely the vibe that we're getting here, one of, of sternness, of aggression, of military might. Um, so this is a, a kind of representative of the emperors at this time, the soldier emperors, um, who are at their core military commanders. And we do see that under the Severans, and that's why we talked about it with Caracalla. Um, but that trend continues and then we're not even seeing any type of family dynasty here um, because we're really seeing just different military commanders take power one after each other, assassinating each other, um, fighting battles with their legions of armies against one another, um, a very mil militaristic society. And so we're seeing that represented in, in Philip's uh, portrait here. Uh, next up is uh, Decius. So Decius uh, ruled, ruled from 249 to 251, so not too too long, only two years or maybe three years. Um, Decius did uh, was part of the the coup to assassinate Philip the Arab. Um, so he succeeds him after this assassination plot succeeds. Um, his portraiture again kind of shows this uh, expression of militarism of of military might um, that we saw under Philip the Arab and others. Um, so we see, um, let's see, an emphasis on the, uh, the shape of the head. He, so we see a very, like, uh, a, a very thought out head shape. It's kind of unique here in the way that it kind of goes back into his skull. Um, it's very, very chiseled the way that his face, um, is carved. It's kind of, like I said, bigger in the back. He has these big ears also. Um, his eyes are drilled also. So these pupils that we've been seeing, they're, they're drilled once again. We have really deep lines in the forehead, um, like over, almost over-exaggerated how, how deep these forehead lines are. Um, they almost look a little unrealistic in, in that sense. Um, so maybe some verism here. Um, we also see a short kind of close cropped haircut on him, very short hair that kind of goes down into a beard that's also similarly um, kind of well-kept. And I think we talked about that with Hadrian maybe, um, the way that his beard wasn't quite the unruly beard of the philosophers from ancient Greece, but it was a little bit more close shaven, you know, close kept, it was a kept beard. Um, and that was more, more linked to someone who's in the military. They, they wanna keep it neat. They're not gonna be an unruly philosopher type. Um, so that's what we see with Decius here too, that he's he's taking care of his beard as, as, a, as a military commander would. 
Um, but we see that his his head is sort of um, downturned a little bit. Um, he's sort of looking, he's looking off, but his mouth is a little bit downturned, excuse me. Um, and that his, his, he's not, you know, doesn't look super pleasant in both of these. Um, he looks maybe a little restless. Again, he's kind of looking out, um, looking out into the future maybe, into whoever's approaching perhaps. Um, so there's sort of a restlessness here. And, and um, that's right, what I was gonna say about the, the head shape is that it's almost an abstracted skull in a way. So it, it, you really see the shape of the skull. Um, so again, there's just uh, it, not super realistic here, but kind of kind of a hyper realism maybe, um, and these exaggerated forms paired with this sort of uh, restless, anxious uh, look on his face um, in that he's kind of, I don't know, maybe contemplating what's coming. Um, and we see that also linked to some philosophy, um, philosophical movements, you know, like, like the Stoics and stuff, um, that in some cases they look very stern and, and ready for battle, and other times they look a little more anxious, um, like maybe they can't, they can't help their fate, you know, maybe whatever's going to come to them is going to come and they just have to let it hit them. Um, this man doesn't look as intense or aggressive. Um, he looks a little more nervous, maybe. Um, so again, just a sign of the the restlessness of the of the period, the the unrest in Rome, um, paired with with military significance here. Um, and also in his in his standing portrait, also we see him looking um, somewhat militaristic. So he has the helmet on, but then he's kind of in this idealized nude uh, heroic male body, right? Um, again, pointing to his his you know military might, his heroism, his strength. Um, his ability to be a good soldier, another one of our, our soldier emperors here. Um, Decius is also going to be notable because he is the first Roman emperor to fall in battle against a foreign enemy. Um, so he was fighting the Goths who had invaded across the Danube um, in a kind of northernish Europe and is the first to actually die in battle. So um, again, another violent death um, that we see from the soldier emperors in this time period um, and the first one to die in battle. Before we move on to his successor though, I want to uh, take a little recess to talk about uh, the kind of technique here. We've talked a lot about drilling, about how the, the pupils are drilled um, and other parts like these really, the deep nasal or the deep uh, forehead lines um, or you know, the, the depth to them um, also indicates drilling, even the way that his hair is done. So the way that we have these um, kind of deep indentations in his hair um, is also going to be evident of a drill. And so what does that mean? Um, what, do I, what do I mean when I'm talking about how something is drilled? Um, so this was a technique um, used uh, in marble carving. And it was a, a kind of a new development, as I said, um, around kind of uh, the end of the second century, maybe. We start to really see it with those carved pupils um, and some other details, as I've, no as I've mentioned. Um, so I want to play a short clip. Um, just we have this man who's going to talk a little bit about how uh, the drilling worked. How did that work to create these really deep indentations? Another tool, which again is a Mediterranean tool, is the drill. And the drill exists now in two forms. This drill, which is a cord drill, it's also sometimes called a channeling tool, but it, a form of this was used by the Romans. And we have a couple of illustrations of Roman carvers working with this kind of drill in which one person pulls the cord and that spins the drill and another person is pushing the drill in. Um, this can also be done as a one person drill by making the cord with a sort of a violin pole bow. And then the same person who is uh, holding the drill can, can action the drill. But that's not as useful as having two people because with two people, you can move the drill around. You can cut channels. You can do all sorts of different things with the drill. An Italian marble worker I know told me that uh, that doing the drill was learning uh, for the apprentice who pulled the cord was learning to uh, learning a schiaffo. That is to say, the cord has a tendency to jump off here. Every time the cord jumped off, the master carver holding this slapped the apprentice on the side of the head. All right, this is. So that's what um, 
we're meaning when we talk about uh, the the drill that the Romans would have used as well. Um, and so here are some some depictions of that. This is maybe they're making a sarcophagus here. Um, and so you see that's the two person method he was talking about. And then this is more the the violin bow method that he was talking about the one person method. And then here's an example of a, a Roman drill that we have. And um, I think this maybe is the type that would have used that kind of cord. So the cord would have maybe been looped around back there um, to to use the drill. So I um, just wanted to clear that up because I know that I've mentioned that a few times. Um, and if you are kind of interested in the more um, technical side of how, how this was done, um, hopefully you found that a little bit interesting. So we're going to pick back up with the soldier emperors. Um, we're not going to look specifically at the successor to Decius, um, but a little bit after him came Valerian. So uh, Decius was uh, killed in battle, right, in 251. Uh, Valerian takes power in 253, so we're skipping ahead a couple of years. Um, Valerian uh, ruled for about seven years, was known for his persecution of Christians, so implemented a lot of policies um, that inflicted harsher punishments on those practicing Christianity, uh, something that he's, he's kind of known for cracking down on. Also notable, though, because he was the first Roman emperor to be captured as a prisoner of war. Um, so like with Decius, we really see these, these so-called soldier emperors of the third century um, really participating in battles. So they're not just sitting on their throne back in Rome in some villa kicked back, um, but they're really out there on the battlefield commanding troops and putting themselves in danger. And so we see Valerian uh, captured by the Sasanians as a prisoner of war, and he ends up dying in captivity um, in Sasanian territory. So uh, we've talked about a lot about the Parthians. Um, the Sasanians, however, are the successors to the Parthians. So uh, we sort of see a shift of power in that part of the world. You can see it on the map here. So the Romans are gonna be in this uh, orangish reddish color. And then it says Parthians, but that's going to be Sasanian at this point. Um, that's the new uh, kingdom or new rulers who take over the Sasanians. So um, that's who we see um, engaging in battle with Valerian's troops. Uh, Valerian is captured um, in this area and we actually see evidence of this in the uh, rock carvings um, from the Sasanians. So this is not a Roman work of art, this is a Sasanian work of art, um, but we see that here. So in this one particularly, um, you know, it would be on a giant kind of cliff face um, sort of, you, you know, there's some similarities maybe to Petra um, and sort of moving that direction. Um, so we see them carved directly into the rock. This is one example of a relief image. Um, and what we see here is uh, Valerian on his knees. So the Roman emperor um, of all of this, you know, the great Roman emperor empire um, is on his knees, uh, essentially surrendering to the Sasanian leader, Shapur I. And he is going to be on a horse here, um, accepting the surrender of Valerian. Uh, so uh, this is also um, a site of uh, a set of victory for the Sasanians, right? It's kind of this this honored place where they beat the the Roman troops. So they're going to erect victory art just like the Romans might do. Um, so we see kind of similar trends here. In terms of the um, imagery itself. So as I said, Valerian is there on his knees and Valerian looks very Roman. So despite this not being a Roman work of art, this was made by Sasanian artists, uh, we see him kind of uh, uh, in the guise of a Roman. <laughs> he looks like he's Roman here. So um, he's got that same close cropped hair, that kind of short military haircut that we see. Um, he has a beard. Uh, he's also wearing Roman armor. So you can see that kind of uh, pleated uh, kilt skirt that they would wear. Um, he has this cape that's kind of blowing behind him. Um, he also wears a laurel on his head. So a laurel, I think we've talked about maybe with Augustus, um, that was kind of that, that wreath that the emperors or rulers would wear. You can just barely see it. If you look really closely, you can see there are some, some leaves there. And so that's a laurel wreath. Um, so the Sasanians are depicting him as an emperor. Um, so similar to the way um, that Romans often depicted their enemies or their uh, captured prisoners as strong and mighty to kind of show the, the great victory that they had and therefore as a reflection of their own strength. Um, we're seeing a similar thing here with the Sasanians um, depicting him as royalty. So they're really emphasizing that they've captured um, a Roman military man, but also a emperor of the Romans. Um, we do see uh, kind of also similar conventions of the artwork at this time, so fairly flat figures, um, not super frontal maybe, although the, the king is a little bit, 
Um, but this one, but there's still kind of some weird frontality. It doesn't look super naturalistic. It's a little bit more um, abstracted or a little bit more uh, flat. As I said, there's not a lot of dimension um, or depth to the to the human figure here, um, which also, as I said, kind of mimics the what we're seeing in the artwork in Rome at this time. So definitely some communication, I think, between these two cultures. Um, and as for our uh, Sasanian king, Shapur I, um, he is looking very mighty also. He's looking quite idealized. He's got um, musculature, you know, these, these muscular shoulders, um, this kind of thin waist, and then he's wearing this, this big crown. You can see that here. Uh, he's got this very like epic crown on um, and a very strong facial expression and sort of a chiseled face as well, um, as well as some, some jewelry perhaps. So he is looking very regal, very strong and mighty as the victorious general who has uh, taken prisoner this, this Roman emperor. So Valerian dies in 260 and when that happens we actually see a sort of fragmentation of the emperor, empire in that there is going to be a different uh, emperor declared specifically in uh, Western Europe, in sort of Northern and, and Western Europe, the Northwestern part of the emperor, empire. Um, and that is Posthumus. So Posthumus is going to reign from 260 to 269. He is elected emperor by his troops. So he was stationed in Germany. He was um, a military ruler there. And when Valerian dies, he, his troops are going to um, pronounce that he is emperor, um, but he kind of only stays in uh, around Britain, Germany, and Spain, um, and um, in Gaul as well. And this is kind of a, a new a Gallic empire in a way. So we're seeing um, that he just has control over this one sort of corner of the empire, um, which is a little bit strange and it stays that way for actually 15 years. So we have multiple emper emperors in Rome at this point, um, you know, he would probably still call himself the Roman em emperor, emperor and thinks that he is emperor, um, but his, his territory is only kind of Northwestern um, Europe. And we also see something similar happen in Palmyra with a different leader. So that, that area around Palmyra is also going to be sort of a, a separate empire of the Roman empire. So we're already starting to see some, some fragmentation, which is never a good sign. Um, Posthumus is going to commission his own coinage. So he is going to try to legitimize his rule, start minting coins like any other good emperor would do. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about the coinage that we see because we see some trends here that we see um, with other rulers as well. And um, again, kind of notable because, you know, he's not really the, the, the legitimate emperor, but he's, he's minting his coins anyway. Um, so uh, what do we see here? So we see him in profile. So he has, um, it's just kind of the half of his face, right? Profile view. Um, we're seeing a, a beard on him, quite a thick beard, a full head of hair, kind of curly hair perhaps. Um, but what stands out the most is this massive crown that he wears, um, this massive uh, kind of, you know, pointy <laughs> spikes on a, on um, a headband that he's wearing, um, which really dominates the scene. Um, it is really the center of the scene, even though his head is there. So his face is almost on this half of the coin, but in the center is this crown. So the crown is really the focus of this coin. And like I said, we see this on some other rulers as well. So Gordian, who was a little bit earlier, we didn't talk about him, um, but we see him wearing the same crown. And this is called a radiate crown, a radiate crown. You can see it at the bottom. And it is named this because it resembles uh, the rays of the sun. So that's what it's referencing here. These, these spikes that are coming off of it are supposed to be like the rays of the sun. And again, we've talked a lot about how um, emperors loved to connect themselves with the sun god, Sol, um, as sort of a, 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 a show of their dominion, you know, their power. Um, the sun is kind of over the whole empire, right? So they are also kind of in control of the whole empire. Um, so we see that in their, their iconography here, this crown that they're going to be depicted in. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying with the Severans, where they really start to deck themselves out in, in imperial um, garb and kind of lavish um, uh, clothing or jewelry, um, and especially in these, these crowns that we see. Uh, another reason that we're talking about coins just at all is the fact that um, emperors at this time didn't really have time to make monumental architecture. If you're only in power um, for, you know, be six, nine years, um, and you're fighting the whole time, you're out on a battlefield, you're, you're dealing with threats to your reign, you're trying to legitimize yourself, um, it's very difficult to get building projects in place um, that might not be your priority at the moment. So in such a time of unrest and uncertainty, 
um, we're not seeing a lot of large scale building. And so we're kind of relying on the coinage to fill in the gaps here about what these emperors were thinking and what their um, intentions were. Uh, we're going to move now to Aurelian. So here's another coin um, that we see of one of these rulers, these soldier emperors. Um, Aurelian took the throne in 270, and you can see that the coins that he mints are also uh, in that same style. So he has kind of um, a little bit closer cropped haircut. Uh, he has a beard, and then he's wearing that giant crown that you really can't miss. Um, it's very obvious when you look at this coin. Um, on, on the back here, we see a depiction of Aurelian, and he is shaking hands with a personification of Concordia. Concordia, who is the kind of personification of harmony, of a little bit of peace, kind of unity, um, concord, that's also a word we could use. So we see this um, on the back of the coin. He's shaking hands with a personification of Concordia um, as sort of a, a, a reference to the stability that he is trying to bring to the empire. And we really see that with Aurelian. So Aurelian, when he takes power, um, really wants to, like I said, bring stability back to the empire. And so he does that in a few ways. The first is that he um, reclaims territory from those fringe empire empires that we have. So the Gallic Empire that Posthumus was leading, the one in Parthia, or sorry, uh, Palmyra, the one in Palmyra. Um, he's going to reunite the Roman Empire. So we have these fragmentations and he's going to bring them back together um, as a, a unified Roman Empire. So that's the first thing that he does to kind of um, create some stability and also some peace. So trying to um, uh, kind of lessen the military violence that's going on around the empire. He also defeats invaders in Northern Italy. So people who are trying to invade the Italian peninsula, he defeats them and pushes them back. Um, so we see this, this, this depiction of, of harmony as a reference to his ability to uh, kind of calm things down, reunite the empire, put them at peace for a second. However, we also see that paired with the Aurelian Wall in Rome. Um, this is a massive defensive feature. So although Aurelian is um, trying to portray the stability and harmony that he is going to bring to the empire, he's unifying everyone, defeating these enemies, there's still sort of sense of anxiety there. He's still a little bit worried about the threats to Rome. And so he's going to build this 12 mile long wall around the city of Rome. Um, so you can see that in red on the map there. And uh, yes, as I said, 12 miles long, it's gonna be uh, 20 feet tall and 13 feet thick at the base. Um, there are uh, 18 gates. So this is one of the gates that we see. Um, and those gates are each going to be paired with this, these kinds of gate houses. So these, these rounded features, uh, which again, you know, can, you can have archers up there, you can have other soldiers up there, um, kind of patrolling the whole city. So 18 gates and 18 uh, gatehouses on a 12 mile long wall uh, with 20 foot high walls, essentially. Um, so it's really, it's, a, you know, a defensive feature for sure, as, like I said, a sign of the, the fact that um, Rome is not at peace yet, there is still much work to be done, and there's still some anxiety that uh, invaders could still um, enter the city of Rome. Um, it's not exactly the <laughs> feat of engineering, um, it's quite a simplistic wall, so it was kind of quick to erect and just sufficient for, for the job that needed to get done at the time. Um, it's made of stone, um, not concrete, so that's going to make it a little bit uh, sturdier, a little bit more hard to knock down um, if it's just made of cut stone versus, versus concrete. Um, and it also um, was doubled later on in the uh, fourth century. Their height is even going to be doubled, and so you can actually, I think maybe that might be what that line is, I'm actually not sure, um, but their height's going to be doubled in, in size. Um, so again, just showing that this unrest is going to continue, that we need to even double these walls. Um, Aurelian is going to be murdered by high-ranking officials in his army, um, which is the cause of death of most of these, these emperors. Um, and so his fears about uh, the unrest in the kingdom were not unfounded. Um, and he definitely, um, for his attempts at bringing stability, he did have some success in reunifying the empire, um, building defensive features, but unfortunately couldn't escape that fate himself. 
So we're going to move to Diocletian. Uh, Diocletian, if if you're not going to remember anyone in this lecture, remember Diocletian. He's he's one of the most significant um, emperors in the third century. So Diocletian is going to take power in 284, and like Aurelian, he is going to be very concerned with uh, the seemingly fragile state of the Roman Empire, and he's going to try to do things to stabilize it. He's going to think about how can we end this third century crisis end this rapid succession of leaders, of, of people killing each other for the throne, and bring stability back to Rome. And so what he does is he's going to establish something called the Tetrarchy. Tetrarchy, which if you look at tetra, that means four, and then archy is like rule. So the rule by four is the Tetrarchy. Um, something else that he's going to do, so we kind of talked about, uh, and we'll get back to the Tetrarchy in a minute, but something else that he's going to do, we talked about how the empire um, was just so big at this time. It was so massive um, and hard for one man to control. Um, and so what Diocletian is going to do, he's also going to separate the military and civilian authority in the Roman provinces, because we saw that the military was kind of causing some problems. They would, you know, declare their own general emperor and uh, be fighting each other. You know, there was lots of infighting and things. And so he's separating that military authority from the civilian authority to kind of uh, bring some more stable ruling to the provinces. Um, and he's also going to subdivide the provinces from their um, initial kind of size to smaller ones that are easier to manage. So more provincial governors instead of, you know, one person in charge of all of the Levant. Um, maybe now there's someone who's just in charge of kind of the Jerusalem area, something like that. So um, he's going to to kind of um, fragment the empire, but in a good way, in a, in a way of, of making it stronger. Um, so what do we see here, though, with his um, portraiture before we get back to the Tetrarchy? So we actually see a little bit less individualization here. So this is not as um, specific a portrait as we saw with some of them, you know, with um, Decius and his really skull-like head. Um, Philip the Arab, he had kind of a blocky head and looked, and looked very militaristic. Um, this is almost someone who just looks very generalized. So we're going to see a little bit of a decrease in individualization here. Um, we also still see some of those same conventions. So he still has a little bit of that X that Caracalla and Philip the Arab had. So we see these nasolabial lines and they're kind of mirrored in these little um, kind of curved spaces here, but not to the same extent. He looks a little bit calmer. He doesn't look as angry, as ready to fight as uh, Caracalla and Philip the Arab did. Looks a little bit more um, at peace. He's still going to um, deck himself out in uh, this kind of, uh, uh, what would you call that, crown. Um, so uh, we can actually see some similarities between the crown that he's wearing and the crown that Septimius Severus was wearing on the family portrait. So they're both these kind of rounded crowns and then they have kind of gemstones in them. Um, and then these this natural kind of um, leaf imagery linking the jewel stones. Um, so you can kind of see that it's it's kind of like a laurel. So it's, it's referencing the old style of crown that um, Augustus and other people wore, but it's going to be set with these gemstones and made a little bit bigger and probably made out of gold also. So we're um, a little bit more lavish here um, in this in this depiction. Um, so again, Diocletian, um, similar to things that we've seen before, but a little bit less individualization, sort of becoming a little bit more standardized. Um, a little bit more general. Uh, so what he's going to do, as I said, is establish something called the Tetrarchy, the rule of four. And this is a response to the issues that um, have been happening in Rome. And so we saw this fragmentation, right? We saw where there was kind of different emperors in different places. Um, and Diocletian's kind of going to go, okay, well, we didn't like that. And we want to still be one empire. But the idea of having different emperors rule different places is not the worst idea. So that's what we're going to do. So the rule of four, four emperors, each one gets a different uh, section of the empire. And we're also going to implement a system of um, hierarchy, of ranking, where we're going to have an Augustus who is going to be the senior emperor. He's older, usually has more experience, um, higher up. He has a little bit more authority in that sense. So the Augustus and then the Caesar, who's a, a junior emperor, he's going to be younger, someone kind of an up and coming politician. 
and they each have their own location that they are specifically in charge of. Um, so this is a depiction on this map of where, um, of who the first four were and where each one had. So Diocletian is going to be one of the Tetrarchy. He's going to sort of share power in a way. He's almost giving up a little bit of his power um, because he's seeing this as a way to, to create stability. So Diocletian is going to be one of the um, Augusti, so he's going to be one of the, the kind of older, more senior emperors, and he's going to take the very far east, so he's going to take uh, Egypt, the Levant, kind of Asia Minor area. Um, he's going to appoint Galerius as his Caesar, so that's his um, junior emperor. He's going to take uh, kind of Greece and the Balkans, and then uh, Maximini Ma uh, Maximian is going to be uh, the Augustus in the west, and so he's the senior emperor in the west, Max Maximian. He's going to take North Africa, Spain, and Italy. And then lastly, we have Constantius as the Caesar to Maximian. Maximian, I really can't say his name, huh? Maximian. Um, Constantius is going to be the Caesar, the, the junior to him. And the way that this works is that the junior, the Caesar, is going to succeed the Augustus. And the reason that that is is because then you can't assassinate anyone. Because if you assassinate someone, there's already a succession line in place. So in order for you to take sole power, you'd have to assassinate four men who are all located in different parts of the empire. So that's going to make uh, that a little bit more difficult. And even if one of them, say, you know, Maximian, which is another reason for me to pronounce his name, um, is assassinated, well, Constantius is standing by to take his place. And if Constantius is, uh, you know, maybe you just murder Constantius, he's only the Caesar, so he can be replaced and not, he's not the Augustus, he's not the senior authority. So this rule of four is a, a division of the empire that we're still the Roman Empire. We're still all, all one um, kind of uh, under one rulership, but we're dividing that rulership between multiple people um, for stability, for um, the prevention of assassinations, <laughs> very important, um, and for more local regional control um, so that we can better manage specific areas um, and give them the attention that they need and, and more knowledge of these local issues. Um, so a pretty good idea, honestly. Um, it is going to work for a while. It's going to bring stability to the empire. So this is a great depiction of the Tetrarchy and what it represents for Rome. So uh, this is the portrait of the Tetrarchy. It was originally in Constantinople. It is now in Venice, in St. Mark's Basilica. So if you've ever been to Venice, you might actually have seen it, although maybe you missed it. So if this is uh, St. Mark's Basilica, you can see the facade here. Um, and this is a much later construction, right? This was not here in the Roman era at all. Um, but the uh, statue of the Tetrarchs is going to be over here on the corner. So you can see it there. Um, so next time you're in Venice, right, <laughs> you can go check it out. Um, it was moved during the Fourth Crusade in 1204. So what do we see here? Well, we see a portrait of four men, a statue of four men. It's made of porphyry. Porphyry is this purple stone, and it's often used um, in connection with royal portraits. So it's going to represent royal people, um, emperors. Purple was associated with royalty. The cloaks that emperors would wear were often purple. Um, and we'll see that moving forward too. And so um, porphyry, a purple stone used to represent royalty. And this, uh, this depiction of the four men, um, we have uh, two sets of them. So each one has one Augustus and one Caesar. And the Augustus is going to be the one with the beard because that usually shows the man is a little bit older, right? So the man with the beard, um, you can see he's this one here and then this one here. So the one there and there. Um, both, it's a little bit hard to see that this one's beard, but you can kind of see it. Um, so the Augustus is going to have his hand over the shoulder of his Caesar. So what are we showing here? We're showing concordia, we're showing harmony, we're showing that uh, the Augustus is protecting the Caesar, that they're on the same side. These men are not trying to kill each other, they're not trying to assassinate each other and take each other's power, um, but there really is a rule of four. They are in harmony and they are protecting one another, they have each other's backs. So if you come for one of them, you're coming for all of them. These men are um, dressed in military outfits, so they're still military commanders. They have that um, kind of skirt that the, the Roman uh, soldiers wear. They're each holding, um, they have one hand on a, on a uh, sword. So uh, the sword hilt has the head of an eagle on it, a sign of Rome. Um, so they're kind of showing that they're ready to defend each other. They're ready to fight if needed. Um, they're, they're in this alliance, in this kind of bromance together, right? Um, and we have the two, the East and the West, each protecting each other. Um, 
So what we also see here is a bit of a reduction in sort of the cult of the emperor, the idea of the emperor as this person who's who's elevated, who's who's sort of sitting above everyone else, right? Uh, we saw that a lot in the past, and I was kind of saying that was almost one of the problems that, that the personality um, had become too big of the emperor. And so what we're seeing here is the direct opposite of that, in that we are decreasing the individualization of each of the figures. So these figures are not each depicting a specific person. You can't look at one of them and go, oh, yep, that's Diocletian. I can pick out which one he is. Um, but instead, they look very generalized. They essentially all have kind of the same face. Um, and they're very simple faces. Also, they're not super complex or elaborate. Um, it's a more generalized portrait. And so we're not trying to enhance one specific person. We're not um, you know, representing Augustus and his whole life story here, we're actually purposefully doing the opposite in that we're trying to um, get rid of the individual characteristics of each emperor and put the emphasis on Rome, on the state, on the rule of four and the concordia, the harmony that all of the men have, that no one man is more important than any of the others. And as I said, this is a big contrast from things like the Augustan period, um, what we saw on the Arapacus. Remember, we talked about how you could pick out specific people that you see. Um, you know, it was like a who's who of the imperial world. Um, you could look and say, oh, yep, that's Livia. I recognize her because she looks like all her other portraits. Yep, that's Marcus Agrippa. I've seen a bunch of portraits of him. I can recognize him and pick him out right away. Um, we're not doing that here. We're not emphasizing individual people. We're, we're generalizing on purpose. We're trying to kind of de decrease the amount of celebrity associated and this kind of this arrogant cult in a way associated with one man. And we're trying to, to generalize. Um, what we also see here is a bit of a, a simplification in a way also in their outfits. So um, Diocletian, yeah, we did see him in his individual portrait where he had that big crown, right? We said it was similar to Septimius Severus. And then we had the, um, the radiate crown on, on people like Gordian that we see here. Um, but the, the tetrarchs are going to have very simple caps. They're almost not even crowns. They're kind of crowns, I guess, but they're, there's no like bejeweling on them, no decoration. They're just these like flat blocks that go around their head. Um, so the emphasis here also is on their military outfit, as I said, that they are, they're looking more like, like soldiers. Um, they're dressed in armor, they have their hand on their swords ready to go, um, and they're less of this emperor, you know, who's living this lavish lifestyle, and more of almost like an army unit. So um, a big change that we're seeing here in how the emperor has been depicted for literally centuries, um, that we're, we're trying to solve some of these problems that, that Rome has been having. Um, we also see, uh, if we look more stylistically, we see um, the same kind of conventions that we've been seeing this trend toward more abstracted art, toward more flat art, frontally oriented art. Um, we're seeing all of that in this sculpture. And so if you compare it to the panel of Septimius Severus on the Arch of the Argentarii, um, we're seeing again very frontally oriented figures. So although they're interacting, there's multiple people in this scene like Septimius and Julia Domna, um, the two tetrarchs are kind of embracing, but they're not like, it's not a full on hug. It's kind of um, just a, a, a sort of um, a superficial connection here with that arm. Um, the focus is, is frontal. It's on the person, the viewer, um, more so than, than the scene that's happening between these two people. Um, so uh, we also see kind of, yeah, another flatness. Um, so not super naturalistic here. Um, it would be very strange if they got up and started walking down the street. You would be like, that doesn't really look like a real person. Their, their facial features are a bit more abstracted. Um, they have those big eyes that are kind of characteristic of those Fayum portraits and then portraiture at this time, um, those sort of more bulging, abstracted eyes. Um, so in all, this is um, really a piece of, of late antique art. This is really characteristic of what we know of as late antique art compared to more Roman art, uh, imperial art that we see like under Augustus, under um, earlier emperors. It's not classical in style. It's really not. It's um, very uh, italic, as we've said, which is often flat and frontally oriented. Um, it's not individualized. It's very generalized to show that you know, one, no one man is more important than the other. Um, so really a, um, a, a marked difference that we see here um, and in direct reaction to the problems that Rome has been having in an attempt to bring stability to the empire. Um, just to look also a little bit more at their movement. So um, again, there's that kind of um, uh, hand on the shoulder, um, but just to show you again, uh, the frontally oriented, um, uh, kind of positioning of their bodies and that 
the way that they're interacting, they're not even making eye contact. So um, the people on the Arapakis, you know, this person is directly looking there. The children are really looking. There's a direct like line of sight that they are making towards someone else's eyes, trying to make eye contact. And these men are both peering off into space. They're peering into different directions. They're not looking at each other. Um, so just another difference here that we see in kind of that frontal orientation that they're looking outward and they're not inward facing, um, they're looking more outward. Um, and something else that I didn't mention before, so if you notice um, his foot is missing, um, well, while it was moved from um, Constantinople to Venice, uh, this man's foot got left behind. And so if we go back, um, I didn't point it out before, um, they were doing archaeology and they actually found the corner of, of the statue that had been missing um, for centuries. And so uh, the one tiny corner is in Istanbul in a museum today, and the rest of it is in Venice. Um, so kind of a, there's, a, there's one in each of its uh, two main locations, um, kind of just a, a funny point there. Um, so we're going to move forward. We're going to move back to Rome at this point. Um, we're going to look at something called the Decanalia base. And it was created in um, commemoration or celebration, I should say, of the 10 year anniversary of the Tetrarchy. So this has been working. These men have been in power for 10 years. Um, we're achieving a little bit of stability and we're going to celebrate that. We're going to celebrate that this this new system of government that Diocletian set up is actually working. So um, Deccan Yali base, um, it's uh, the base of a massive column, which no longer exists. You can see a little bit um, of, of the end of the column there. Um, and it has some relief sculpture on it. And so um, what we see here are the tetrarchs. We see them again on the, on the, the, the uh, kind of relief frieze on the, on the base of the column. Um, and we see them processing. So they're kind of, they're maybe processing through the city. Um, they're walking together. Um, they're wearing these thick, heavy, folded garments that are folded uh, with a big band over their chest. Um, so we see them looking, uh, they're dressed similar. They're all kind of wearing the same outfit like we saw on the uh, porphyry test tetrarchs, um, that same military outfit. Here, it's not so much military. Um, it's more kind of like a robe, um, but still the same outfit. And they are also looking fairly flat and frontal. So they um, are not super naturalistic. They're not in very high relief. They're in fairly low relief. Um, there's not a lot of dimension to them. There's, there's no way these could be in the round. Um, they're much more, more flat than that. Um, and their bodies too, they kind of have these wide bodies in a way, um, which you can see the whole kind of like a width of their chest in a way. So um, very frontally oriented also, um, not a lot of dimension. Um, if we look also at another side of it, so we have some winged victories here. This is a little bit higher relief. Um, we're seeing them, them come off of the pedestal a little bit more. Um, and there is a shield that these these winged victories are holding, which basically says happy 10th, uh, like happy 10th anniversary to the Tetrarchs. Um, and so we're seeing again that this, this system is working a little bit, um, that there's some stability here. And the, the idea that victories are holding this shield, um, you know, a, a sense of victory, military victory, maybe, um, you know, the might of Rome, but also the victory of this governance system, um, and that the idea that Rome is a little bit more prosperous at this point. Um, so this is the, uh, the Decanalia base in the Roman Forum. Something else that Diocletian builds, though, um, sort of one of uh, the elements of construction that are associated more with him specifically, um, is this giant bath complex. So I wanted to stay in the city of Rome for just a second um, to talk about the baths of Diocletian, because last time we talked about the baths of Caracalla um, and how just massive and luxurious those were. And Diocletian is going to say, I see you, Caracalla, and I'm going to raise you one. So we see an even grander uh, bath complex here, even larger than the baths of Caracalla. Um, huge, uh, just again, has all different types of rooms. So we see rooms for both um, classic bathing uh, elements. So the Frigidarium, Frigidarium Tepidarium, Caldarium. Uh, the Frigidarium might have been open air. So these, this is kind of reversed. So the, the plan, um, the kind of this rounded element is that rounded element back there, um, the theater, I guess. So we're kind of flipping it. Um, so the Frigidarium is going to be this open space, so an open air Frigidarium. Um, uh, we see, yes, we see bath um, bathrooms, essentially rooms for different types of baths, um, but we also see libraries and rooms for the arts, so things that Caracalla's baths had, um, this idea of a sound mind and a sound body, that you're going to work your mind and you're going to work your body all in the same place. Um, so we see these, these libraries and, and lots of um, social gathering rooms, um, but we also just see, um, you know, a lot of lavish 
uh, architecture. So it was all made of brick faced concrete. So we see a lot of different types of vaulting and domes. I believe the um, tepidarium, the tepidarium was probably domed. Um, so we see kind of, again, this expression of, of concrete that we can do. Uh, an aqueduct would have brought the water here. So again, using um, the concrete architecture um, or this infrastructure that, that Rome has kind of perfected over the centuries. Um, we also have a lot of remains today. So that is the brick faced concrete, as you can see. Um, a lot of actually, yeah, a lot of good remains today. Still some standing architectures. So you can see how tall it would have been. Um, you can see um, the types of architecture. So the curving of the buildings and these, these high vaulted ceilings. And um, one of the, the most spectacular remains that we have um, are the vaults and some of the marble revetment from the baths, which were reworked into a church in the 16th century by Michelangelo. Um, so Michelangelo was able to design a church that incorporated these Roman ruins into it. Um, so you can go visit it today and you'll see a blending of the, the Roman architecture from um, you know, the third century with a, a 16th century Renaissance revival uh, architecture. So um, pretty cool to kind of see maybe this is how it actually kind of would have looked, you know, not all of this is original, but you can imagine that this, the types of marble revetment paired with these vaulted, these groin vaulted ceilings, um, or that's like a fenestrated sequence of groin vaults with the windows letting light in, um, it would have been a pretty grand space and a pretty, a pretty um, luxurious space. And so this is perhaps showing that now that Diocletian is in power and has implemented the Tetrarchy, again, we have a little bit more stability. And so, as I said earlier with the coinage, we kind of have to look at coinage because those emperors didn't create much monumental architecture. Um, but with Tetrarchy, we're seeing a little bit more stability. You know, they've ruled for 10 years, all good. Um, so we're able to build some more monumental architecture. We can kind of turn our attention to um, building things uh, rather than focusing solely on defense on only, you know, the only thing we can build is defensive walls like Aurelian did. Um, we're able to build some more um, leisure architecture here because Rome is a little doing a little bit better. So kind of a, a sign of the changing of the times. Um, if we move now to Greece, so Galerius was another one of the four tetrarchs. Um, he uh, had that kind of area in um, Greece and the Balkans. Um, he was um, uh, Diocletian's Caesar. So he was the younger one underneath um, Diocletian. And so he's going to build some monumental architecture in his own uh, kind of province, in his own area of the empire. And that's what we see here, the Arch of Galerius. So it is in uh, modern day Thessaloniki in Greece. Um, and it is going to be brick faced as well, but it's actually not concrete in the middle. It's a, a rubble masonry. So it's kind of just blocks and, um, or sorry, rocks and mortar uh, put together. And then it's going to be paneled with marble. So the marble is going to make it look pretty nice. Um, and it is an octopylon. So if you remember, we had the tetrapylon, which is four gates. This is going to be eight gates, octa meaning eight. So it has eight gates. It's a massive thing. Um, you can see here the rubble masonry on the inside, so not concrete, but it's actually these stones which have kind of just been like mortared together um, and then covered with brick. And then if we, um, hold on one second, I want to show you the reconstruction. Um, so we can see just how massive it would have been. So this is if you're, you're standing inside it. I mean, it's a massive gate. It's almost a building in its own right. Um, and so there would have been, I believe, it was like a, a three, three bayed on each side. Um, and then two more on either end. So that's the, the eight gates. Um, but if we go back, so I want to talk a little bit about the relief sculpture that we see here. So these reliefs represent uh, the Tetrarchy because Glarius is one of the uh, Tetrarchs, right? So um, first thing that we see on this upper register, well, first of what we see is a lot of um, vegetal imagery, um, like we're used to seeing. We even have some egg and dart molding or um, uh, lining on the top. And then we have these leaves and some, some rosettes and swirls here. Um, but next in this re uh, relief uh, scene, we see Galerius on horseback and he is entering the city. Um, and we have people kind of lining the streets waiting for him, these people who look like they're looking at him, um, maybe waving or something. Um, so we see Galerius entering the city on horseback. Uh, probably even the city that we're in, he might be entering Thessaloniki, um, since this is, uh, you know, where we see the, the, the arch. Um, and then below that we have, um, so if we're just moved downward, so this one is the one down here. So this person on horseback, um, all probably also Galerius, he's on horseback still, but the, this time the horse is kind of rearing up um, it's got its hoofs off the ground and there's some kind of barbarian, uh, you know, foreign soldier underneath the hoof. 
um, kind of getting trampled right here. And then he's sort of doing battle with maybe another horse and another enemy. Um, so we see Galerius in battle. We see him probably winning the battle, right? Um, uh, uh, so kind of a, a battle scene here showing also one of the roles of the emperor. And then below that, um, in this final register, we see the four tetrarchs enthroned. So there are all four rulers here. The two Augusti are in the center and they're flanked by their two Caesars. So the two men seated are the Augusti. So that's gonna be um, uh, Diocletian um, and Maximian. And then the other two, um, the Caesars, are going to be on either side, Constantius and Galerius. So um, we're seeing again that even though this is the Arch of Galerius, it's in Thessaloniki, and he's going to, yeah, he's going to show himself off a little bit, but he's also going to pay home homage to the, the ones who are ruling with him. It's a, Remember, the rule of four, no one man is more important than the others. So um, we have images of Galerius here, but then he's also going to include his fellow rulers. Um, and be, around that group, around the Tetrarchs, we see a whole host of personifications um, of different parts of the empire. So we see uh, ones representing Syria, Britain, Armenia, the Tigris and Euphrates, um, and then also kind of honor, uh, honorific qualities, um, like, like virtue, there's a representation of virtue. So all of these things that the Roman Empire is supposed to uh, encapsulate, these different parts of the empire and different virtues, um, all are flanking the, the four men who are ruling. And if we look a little bit at the, the style in which this is done, um, we see that it's consistent with the other uh, types of sculpture at this time that we've already looked at. So very frontally oriented figures. Um, we see sort of the width of their chest. They're all facing outward. Um, there is some engagement with one another. You know, maybe their arms sort of are in front of one another, but they're looking more at the viewer than they are at each other. So um, uh, much more uh, frontally oriented. Um, it's less naturalized, so we are naturalistic, so it's a little bit more abstracted. Um, we don't see an individualization of the features on these. Um, you actually can't really see their faces anymore, um, but still, it's, it, you know, you can't really even tell which man is which. It's just we know these are the four tetrarchs, but we can't really pick out which one's Galerius. You know, we know the two Augusti and the two Caesars, but other than that, not sure which man is which. Um, so again, we're, we're reinforcing the, the authority of the four men here. Um, there's also a sort of like rigid formality here. Um, they're not super dynamic or, or loosey goosey kind of. There's a lot of symmetry. Um, and um, they're also the Tetrarchs are definitely imposing their power. Um, they are as a hierarchy of scale. So they're appearing a little bit bigger than those around them. Um, so they're obviously more important since they're a little bit bigger. Um, they're right in the middle also. Um, and overall, what we, might, what we might be seeing also is kind of influence from sarcophagus paneling, actually. Um, the way that these scenes are composed, um, the type of material that's used, and the type of sculpture that's used. Um, it's thought that maybe the person who did this was a sarcophagus uh, sculptor, or at least was influenced by um, sarcophagi at the time, um, because we kind of see similarities here. So um, once again, an arch that is very much uh, rooted in this time. Um, and something else that I just wanted to kind of point out here, um, when we talk about things being more abstracted, when we talk about them being um, a little bit less dynamic or anything like that, although this scene is, is pretty dynamic here, um, we do have a lot of movement there. Um, but I just want to reinforce that there's not one that's better than the other. So it's not like this is um, a decline in artistic ability or quality. Um, that's kind of um, a way that people have categorized it in the past, like Winkelmann, for instance, you know, the, the father of art history, who we talked about at the beginning of this course, um, he would have said that this was a decline, and he would have been very subjective about it. Um, but we've kind of uh, um, learned more since then, and, and the critical analysis that we can apply to this type of art, um, everything is done with a choice in mind, you know, it's a choice of how you want to depict something. Um, so we're not seeing that, um, there's uh, that there there there's a decline in skill um, because we actually do see some classical inspired things um, and so and we'll actually get to that in a second but um, there's it's a choice to depict things in a certain way to depict them not in the classical style um, we talked about how this is a little bit more italic inspired so it's a little bit more kind of going back to their Italian roots rather than copying uh, the Greeks. But also the idea, I just really want to hammer this home, of um, a lack of individuality and the, the sort of generalization here. Um, and we've talked about how that's um, 
goes hand in hand with this idea of distributing power that no one man is more important so they're not going to be individualized um, but there is also still a serious sense of authority that the tetrarchs are more important than the other people they might not be one more important than each other but they're more important than the populace um, and there's a there's that sense kind of of the emperor uh the position of emperor even if not one specific man as a type of eternal position um, a, side of, a sort of timeless position that there's this isn't rooted in a certain period, um, but this is this is a, 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 a position that will, in their minds, you know, last forever. This is a, a, an eternal institution. And so we're depicting them. We're not trying to make Augustus look like a, a Greek god. We want to make it a little bit more generalized, a little less individualized, um, something that could more apply to any age and isn't, you know, to them in their minds rooted to a specific time period um, because it's the idea of the eternal nature of the emperor, um, that, that, that this is a position that's going to last forever. Even though the one man may change, Rome will endure and the, the imperial structure of Rome will endure. So um, just a note about you know, why these choices, these artistic choices are made. Um, so going back, uh, this is kind of the structure of it. We already talked about this. Um, the arch though was also connected to a larger palace complex. So Galerius kind of built a whole complex here for himself that included a stadium like you can see uh, back here. Um, and then you can see that the gate that we were just looking at is right here. Um, and then going off of it is um, uh, a kind of connection, a colonnaded walkway to uh, his um, rotunda. And that's what we're gonna be looking at next. And if you go to Thessaloniki today, you can see that the two are in uh, direct connection to each other. So even though the colonnade doesn't exist anymore, um, you can still see how they're kind of closely related. Um, so just very briefly, the rotunda of Galerius. Um, this was intended to be his mausoleum. He ends up being buried somewhere else. Um, and it ends up being turned into a Christian church in the late fourth century. So the, the end of the 300s. Um, but it is just another um, kind of, of um, type of architecture um, that we see being influenced by structures like the Pantheon and the expanded use of the dome. So this is a rotunda, a round building, kind of a round cylinder base. And then it was topped with a dome. Um, and uh, a circular with these these kind of arches for um, entryway and these may have held statues. Um, and if we look at the inside, also kind of an impressive interior, interior space. So this is the entrance and then this is the back. So if you've just walked in right here, you're, you would, this is, would be your view, um, the apse in the back. And then um, the different uh, windows to let light in. We have these niches and things. Um, so again, just uh, kind of wanted to mention the fact that we talked about the Pantheon and then kind of left it over there, um, but it definitely was influencing other buildings. Um, and the, the idea of a domed building is going to be um, very important moving forward, especially into the Byzantine Empire, um, which is kind of coming after this late antique period that we're looking at. So um, just a note about that. Um, and so one more thing, you know, I mentioned um, just going back to how uh, the more italic type of relief sculpture was a choice, right, um, especially for imperial imagery. But if we look at elements of private sculpture of things commissioned by private individuals, we do see the persistence of classical forms. So um, I just again, just to make that point, the classical was still the preferred uh, method or type of sculpture for some. And so um, in this sarcophagus that we're looking at um, from around 235 to 250, so um, a little bit prior, but still in the third century, we see very classical forms. So that drapery, that really intense, um, you know, sweeping, elegant drapery, um, the serene expressions on the faces of the people on this sarcophagus, um, the one who's sort of just gazing out and is sort of, you know, lightly holding his his garment here, um, the, but really the just the way that the, the drapery is treated is, is very, um, there's a lot of depth to it. Um, so it's it's not as, as flat as we've seen. Um, there's a little bit more of the contrapposto um, and not as much of that frontal orientation, that very like rigid frontality that I was talking about. Um, but we see a little bit of the hip sway here and then his shoulders are a little offset from his hips. So that's a very classical movement, right? The idea of contrapposto. Uh, so just to show you, like I said, uh, very classical forms that we're seeing here in a private work uh, as compared to the more italic or uh, flat frontal uh, type of abstraction that we see in imperial works. 
Uh, all right, so let's see where are we at. So the tetrarchs, uh, the tetrarchy is created under Diocletian, and we talked about the first four emperors um, who are who are part of this, the, the the first tetrarchy, and we talked about the way this works, right? So there's the juniors and the seniors, and when the seniors die or retire, the juniors are going to take their place. So we have this method of peaceful succession, a peaceful transfer of power. Um, so what's going to happen is uh, Maximian and Diocletian are going to actually retire. So they are not going to die. Um, well, they are going to die, but um, <laughs> sorry, um, not at this point. They're going to retire first and Constantius and Galerius are going to move into their positions. So we can see that here, um, that they were once the Caesars, the juniors, and they're going to move into the Augustus position. Um, and at that point, two new men are going to be elected or chosen to fill the senior, the Caesar roles. So very neat, very tidy. Things are done exactly as they should be done. Um, and then that happens again. So um, uh, not necessarily in the East, but in the West, um, Constantius uh, dies. And it's actually a little bit un uh, unexpected, I think. Um, and so what happens is Severus is appointed to take his place. However, <laughs> the Tetrarchy doesn't last um, forever, and that is going to be influenced by the introduction of one man uh, by the name of Constantine. So Constantine, the son of Constantius, when Constantius dies, um, Constantine is elected by the legions of Constantius. So the men in the military who are very loyal to Constantius, um, they're going to pick his son. They're going to say that we want Constantine to be not the new Caesar, but the new Augustus. We want him to go directly into the senior position. Um, and you know, because we kind of have this accountability system, this, this balance, uh, this, this system of checks and, ba and balances, um, that doesn't happen. And so, and so the others are, are able to make sure that Severus uh, goes correctly from Caesar into Augustus position. Um, and as a consolation, they're going to make Constantine the Caesar of the West. Constantine is not going to be satisfied with this. And he is going to cause some problems that will really change the structure of Rome going forward. So that is where we're going with the course. We only have one week left. Um, this is, you know, the end of ninth week. And so we have 10th week left. Um, and I've decided that uh, I was going to give Constantine just one lecture, but we're actually going to give him two um, because he's just so important. And there's so many changes that take place around his rule and, and in Rome at this time. So his is going to be sort of a combination. We're going to go kind of back and forth next week. Um, between Constantine and early Christianity, because we haven't talked about that a ton. We've kind of just mentioned it in passing, but I want to look more closely at the early Christian artwork that arises in Rome around this time, and especially its connections to Constantine, um, and how that kind of ends our look at Rome. Um, and that's where we're going to, to leave the class at the end of next week. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, like I said, I'll see you next week when we talk about Constantine and we finish up the course. So see you then.